I guess we can start. Thank you all for coming. My name is Scott McLeod. I'm a professor at the American University in Cairo in the School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. I'm out of breath because I've just come from New Cairo. It's about an hour and a half in traffic at this hour, and I ran across Tahrir Square to get here. Um, I'm also, by the way, the editor, the managing editor of the Cairo Review of Global Affairs, which is a new quarterly journal uh, being published by the Gap School. So I don't know if we have any copies on sale, but I urge you to go to the AUC Press bookstore and find a copy. Well, it's a, a great pleasure for me to uh, welcome and introduce uh, my colleague, David Ottaway. David and I, uh, well, I should say I first met David um, more than 20 years ago now in South Africa when I was the Time Magazine correspondent there and he was the Washington Post correspondent. We were both covering the fall of apartheid and the rise of, uh, the release of Nelson Mandela and the rise of the African National Congress. Um, David's uh, youthful appearance will belie the fact that he's been a working journalist for 50 years and has quite a lot of experience as a foreign correspondent. Uh, 50 years of covering international issues, both in Washington but uh, largely overseas. He attended Harvard University and wrote his master's or his thesis, sorry, for his uh, undergraduate degree uh, on Algeria. At that time was in a revolution of its own. And he continued uh, covering that story ultimately for Time Magazine and the New York Times. And then David went on to uh, a 35 year career, very distinguished career as a foreign correspondent and security affairs journalist for the Washington Post. Uh, just to make a couple of references to his background, uh, for the Post, he served as an assistant foreign editor. He served as the Africa Bureau Chief from 1973 to 1979, Cairo Bureau Chief from 81 to 85, National Security Correspondent in Washington, 85 to 90. Uh, then, uh, he was correspondent in South Africa, uh, Central and Eastern Europe, and then finally uh, as investigative special projects reporter in Washington. David is currently the senior scholar at the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. He's the author of many books, most recently The King's Messenger, Prince Bandar bin Sultan, and America's Tangled Relationship with Saudi Arabia, and Chained Together, M Mandela, De Klerk, and the Struggle to Remake South Africa. David is working on a new book, which he's provisionally titled, I guess, Revolution and Counter-Revolution in the Arab World, which he'll talk a little bit about tonight. He's uh, been traveling the region uh, since the Arab Spring, as some people call it, began in December to Bahrain, Morocco, Tunisia, now here in Egypt. He's on the way to Sudan, and I may have left out one or two countries. Uh, David has a special relationship, if I may say, with Egypt. Uh, as I said, he was the bureau chief for the Washington Post here in Cairo in the early 80s. He was in the reviewing stand uh, covering uh, the military parade on October 6, 1981, that uh, resulted in the death, assassination of President Sadat, and began the Mubarak era in Egypt. And uh, just a few months before the Tahrir uprising, he authored a paper for the Wilson Center titled, if I have it correctly here, Egypt at the Tipping Point in which he discussed the, uh, the scenarios for the future of Egypt. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce David Ottaway from the Wilson Center. Thank you. 
Thank you. Well, I was going to say it's a pleasure to be back, but in these circumstances of what happened on Sunday, it's uh, rather tempered in, in my pleasure. We arrived on Saturday and um, watched what happened on Sunday from our hotel. For once, I didn't have to go down and interview individuals and take the risk of being shot at. But uh, um, it really was upsetting, disturbing to see what happened Sunday. And it raises a lot of the questions that I'm, I'm going to raise tonight with you. And really, what it is, what is the meeting of revolution and counter-revolution in the Arab world today? And as Scott said, I've been traveling from Morocco to uh, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, uh, Bahrain just after the Saudi troops moved into Bahrain, uh, on the way to Khartoum and um, trying to get a better handle of what's going on um, across the Arab world today. Um, I have been somewhat skeptical about using this term revolution. Um, and I'm wondering whether it's time to rethink it or not on the part of all of us. Um, I notice Egyptians now are questioning whether the revolution has been betrayed or stolen or derailed or uh, what's gone wrong. So I, I have a feeling we're all in the same quest to try to understand what's going on in, in Egypt today. Um, so I feel we're, we have a common interest in trying to discuss this issue. I think the problem with the term revolution is that it's obscure, it has obscured our vision about what is happening, what's happened, and what is going to happen because it raises enormous expectations. And you think something enormous has already happened, and then within a few months you're not sure it has happened or will happen. And um, it has created enormous expectations and enormous frustrations. And I notice now here in Egypt you're, you have kind of a labor uprising underway with strikes and protests and people demanding higher salaries and better bonuses. And um, I don't know whether this is going to lead to something more substantial that um, might give uh, your initial revolt or uprising more steam and turn it into something else. But uh, it's a very interesting development. I should, I should explain where I'm coming from. When I was uh, in college, I studied European history and majored in the French Revolution. So I've had this fascination with revolutions um, since co college days. That's a long time ago. That's back in the late 50s and early 60s. Um, and while I was in Paris, of course, the Algerian struggle was underway. I was there in 5960. And I, as Scott mentioned, I wrote my thesis on the Algerian Revolution. And then my first job overseas was working uh, with United Press International in Algiers. And there I watched what indeed turned out to be uh, a real revolution because you had a million French people left the country in three months. Independence was in um, early July, and by, I got there in uh, late July, and by September, 800,000 French people had already left. And this created an enormous vacuum. So you had workers taking over the factories, um, taking over farms, setting up uh, workers' councils, they called them self-management um, committees. And you had, a, you had an incredible change in, in the economic system. Communists came and Trotskyites came and they created this kind of proto-communist system. And, um, but you really had incredible amount of change which came out of the nationalist struggle. So that's kind of a particular circumstance. Um, but then when we were in Ethiopia, I, we got there just before Haile Selassie uh, was overthrown. I watched him being overthrown. And I watched 
um, major changes take place with the with the uh, uh, Ethiopian monarchy pulverized, just totally destroyed. A lot of some of the monarch uh, members of the fam royal family killed. Then it turned into a socialist revolution. Of course, you had the military to come in and take over and, and, and set up a communist party. Uh, you, they set up communes, they nationalized the land. Uh, it was really quite, quite uh, an upheaval of social, political, economic. So I've seen two, I've lived two, uh, we lived in Addis Ababa, in fact, we lived under a curfew at night for three years. Uh, while the fighting went on in the city and um, uh, so, you know, I've been through a revolution so I have a sense of what I think uh, a full-scale revolution is all about. So back to the terms revolution and counter-revolution. And where does this <coughs> term come from in contemporary times? Um, I'm th pretty sure it's coming from the Eastern Europe and the so-called color revolutions of Eastern Europe. Uh, but these took place in a totally different context. You have to remember that they occurred well after the collapse of the Soviet Union that had itself brought about major changes in the ruling elite, the system of governance, the ruling ideology, and switch from a socialist to a free enterprise economy. These were all major changes and they all took place before the color revolutions. Um, the so-called bulldozer revolution in Serbia happened in 2000, nine years after the Soviet Union's collapse. The Rose Revolution in Georgia was even later, 2003, and the Orange Revolution in Ukraine in the following year, 2004. So over a period of 13 years, you had sequence, sequential changes in the political, economic, and social systems. And then finally, in a change in the nature of politics with these colored revolutions. But you had all this enormous change before the, these political street protests that turned, overturned governments took place. So this is quite different from what's going on in the Arab world. So I have been recently looking back into contemporary Arab history for parallels, um, precedents, uh, to try and put what's happening in the Arab world today uh, in some kind of uh, Arab historical perspective. And I realize it's way too early to draw, particularly when you're dealing with history, uh, <laughs> to draw any you know, final conclusions. But um, this is what I'm struggling with. Um, and I, I want to go back to remind you all uh, of what happened historically in the Sudan. Um, the first overthrow of a military government in the Arab world happened in the Sudan in 1964. And guess what? They called it the October Revolution. Um, they had no Facebooks. They had no social networking. But they got out on the streets and uh, forced the government the military out. And then what you had afterwards, this is a quick review of the Sudan, um, you had a very unstable um, civilian government for some years. And then you had Jafar Nameri seize power in May 1969. Now, he had his problems fending off coups and, and keeping, uh, keep, keeping himself in power. But he did hold on until April 1985 when he was ousted by another general, Suwar Dahab. And I had at least some firsthand um, uh, experience with this because <laughs> it just so happened Nameri was in Washington. I had just come back from Cairo. And um, he wanted an interview to refute what the Post was reporting. My colleague John Randall was in Khartoum. And um, I walked into the embassy there, and the first thing he did was to berate me and berate the Washington Post for giving all his coverage to street 
protests and riots and said we were exaggerating um, their importance and, and it wasn't anywhere as near as bad as we said it was. And I looked up my article, it came out April 3rd, 1985. Three days later, Namari was out. And he had started, he would rushed back finally the next day, the 3rd or the 4th. He got as far as Cairo and he was, the, the military had already uh, taken power there. Um, and I went back to look at John Randall's coverage and description of this overthrow in Marion. There are so many parallels to what happened with Mubarak that, um, that I just thought you'd find it, you might find it interesting. I'm <coughs> going to read some par <coughs> par <coughs> excuse me, paragraphs from it. The Sudanese army's announcement today that it was seizing power for an interim period followed the, the now classic African coup pattern, including the obligatory promise of a return to civilian rule. Whatever happens, the immediate stimulus for ending President Jafar Nehmeri's 16-year reign came from Sudan's civilian elite and not from the armed forces. Nomeri's downfall came about with the realization by the doctors, lawyers, engineers, and other middle-class professionals that the president was politically isolated at last and could no longer rule by dividing the opposition. Then it goes on in the last card. He was finally arrested, the Muslim Brotherhood down there. Um, and, then, and then John goes on and says, um, Faced with rebellion in the South, remember there was a civil war in the South back then, as just as, <laughs> of course, there is, was until recently uh, again. <clears throat> Namari helped bring about his own down downfall by pushing his contempt for his adversaries too far. He all but dared them to get together while he flew off on a visit to the United States, even as rioters were ransacking his capital. After these violent initial demonstrations, it took the professional elite one week to organize their own peaceful processions, which at times seemed like a throwback to the nationalist uprisings in the 19th century. Their goal was to provoke a re rerun of the October Revolution of 1964. At that time, intellectuals engineered the downfall of the military government headed by Field Marshal Ibrahim Aboud. Within 24 hours of the, of the first demonstration by the mostly middle class and middle aged Sudanese in Khartoum Wednesday, the, the leader, uh, this is John Garang, uh, goes into talks with the government. This confirmed the professional elite's hunch that the armed forces initially would refuse to take part in crowd control operations. Does that sound familiar? Here? And then could be won over to depose the Mary. Um, well, that's enough. I just, just, just the parallels really struck me, and um, uh, I, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that now about the Sudanese model. Uh, so Sawar Dahab, he comes in. There's another short period of civilian rule that ends when the current ruler. Um, then Colonel Omar Bashir seizes, seizes power in 1989. So you have this Sudanese model of political governance, really since the independence of the country in 56, of going back and forth between alternate military and civilian rule. And usually the reason the civilian do not succeed is they can't deal with the economic problems of the country. Is this going to be a parallel here? Um, another thing that's striking is how the political elite that have been involved, the civilian elite, have been involved in um, the hist contemporary history of Sudan. They're, th they're the same people. In fact, I'm going down to Khartoum next and making appointments to see Sadiq El Mahdi and Hassan Torabi that I was interviewing back <laughs> in the in the early 1980s, and they're still there, and they're still you know they're still players on the political scene. <laughs> um, now, so you have the Sudanese model that I'm keeping in mind, but then you have a, a real revolution here in 1952, and this to me is without a doubt a full-scale 
what you can define as a revolution. When Gamal Abdel Nasser comes in here, he gets rid of the monarchy. There's a whole new political elite comes into power. You, you have, um, he, he, he nationalizes the land, he nationalizes the private companies, changes the whole political system into Arab socialism, as it was called then. Um, you have a whole new, new uh, um, society structures. I mean, this to me was a real revolution. And when I think of revolutions and Arab revolutions, um, this really stands out. Um, without any doubt, a revolution. But then you had other things going on in the Arab world after that with the Ba'ath Party. And the Ba'ath Party comes to power in Syria in, in 1963, and then it comes in Iraq in 1963, and then it gets thrown out again and comes back in 1968. And it, too, produced substantial changes, social, economical, and political, and created a new kind of government of party, military, mixed together and running the countries. Um, but they brought in a socialist economy, and, and um, um, you know, there were, there, were, there were real changes taking place. But I find very few ref references of anybody talking about the Syrian revolution or the Iraqi revolution. But these were, these were major changes in all sectors, political, military, and so uh, civilian, the ruling elite, the economy, and the society. So with these various examples of Arab uh, revolutions in mind, what, what do we have here in Egypt? I mean, I fully realize this is early times. We don't know, you know whether we're just at the beginning of something or it's the end of something or um, what's coming next, but um, let's just talk about what we know about so far. First, there's no sign of any change in the economic system. A lot of people have been thrown in jail for corruption, the business people, leading business people, uh, but I haven't seen any, I realize there are four um, uh, private companies that have been renationalized because of the corruption surrounding how they were bought from the state in the first place. But I don't see any kind of main, major economic changes taking place here back to socialism. I don't see any major changes coming in the uh, social system. Nobody's talking about a social upheaval or, you know, uh, anything like what happened in Ethiopia or, or in Egypt in 1952 and 1953. Um, but the only thing people seem to be talking about is, is you know, is, will there be more Islamization or will there not be more Islamization? And will the Sharia be applied in a more draconian fashion than before? But I don't see any major social revolution about to take place. And then you have the political arena. You know, is there going to be any real change? Is there going to be a new political lead, even, running Egypt? Are you going to have a presidential or parliamentary system, or, or will the military end up remaining in power? Will it become the Sudanese model? Um, now, I, I know you're worried about this, too. And as outsiders, we're trying to figure out what's going on. So we're, we have a common interest. We're all trying. I hope we'll have a lively discussion about this afterwards. Uh, when I finish talking. Um, any can, I don't think you can talk about a revolution in the political sphere either. Um, so if revolution as a term seems premature and maybe even a long shot, um, there, there are substantial changes underway. I mean, you have 100 plus political parties. The political culture is changing here. People are asserting themselves. Uh, they're not, you know, they don't believe what the government says anymore. Um, so you have uh, Tahrir Square where you had millions of people protesting and, you know, you're mobilized, etc. And I would say these are, these are the preconditions for serious change, but it's not sufficient. And I think you're beginning to realize it too, that you, you can have a change of attitude about government, but that doesn't mean the government's going to change. So what should we call what's going on here in Tunisia, the two most advanced um, cases of uprisings. 
I noticed Hillary Clinton used the expression the other day of democratic awakening. And I've noticed a, a Saudi analyst friend of mine called it a people's coup as opposed to a military coup. You know, certainly it's been a popular uprising or a popular revolt. And certainly there has been a, you know, a democratic Arab awakening. You know, maybe eventually we will end up calling it a, you know, a democratic revolution. But we don't know that yet. And I, it bothers me to start using the term before it's, it's happened. Um, now, Egypt is the most, to my mind, the most ex interesting example of, of the discussion of the term revolution. And to me, Saudi Arabia seems the, sort of the, the example of counter-revolution. Put it in quotes. Um, I, I go to Saudi Arabia regularly, and I was, I was there in um, uh, March again, um, just after they tried to hold what they called March 11th, the Day of Rage. Um, and Facebook was going strong. They had 17,000 people signed up to show up. Um, and then the government made it absolutely clear that it was not going to allow any protests. And it got the, the religious leaders, the Wahhabi establishment, to come out and say, this is fitna, haram, um, and uh, you know, it's just re religiously not permitted. And the government says, anybody who de demonstrates, we're going to we're going to put you in jail and know it ahead of time. They call in all the editors of the newspapers and say, you know, we're not going to put up with this and don't give it any support. Um, and indeed, on March 11th, in Riyadh, exactly one protester showed up <laughs> with a swarm of journalists around him vying to hear what he had to say about, you know, pro-democracy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, there had been some Shia demonstrating that two days before down in the eastern province, but the Shia have been doing their own kind of thing separate from um, sort of the liberal pro-democracy groups in Riyadh and, and Jidda. Um, now, so what did the king do? He, to, to try and deal with the and, and convince people not to, not to. Um, well, first he said he made it absolutely clear we're not going down the slippery slope of protest in the street. And then he started throwing money out to help try and solve the problems of the middle class. And finally, he's committed himself to about 130 billion dollars in building homes, and they're, they're starting mortgages so people can buy homes. Finally. Um, they're going to build, I think, 600,000 units, 500,000 units. Um, they've, they, they, put, they gave everybody two months bonus, <laughs> even students studying abroad. <laughs> I mean, they just did everything to quiet dissent in the country. Um, now, is this counter-revolution? Well, you know, they've kind of been doing this all along. I was there in 2004 when in 2005, when King Abdullah was just coming to power, he came in 2005, but even in 2004, he was the person dealing with all the discontent in, in the kingdom. And there were all kinds of petitions, and just kind of a new, people talked about a spring, Riyadh, you know, like uh, Prague Spring, uh, this is Riyadh Spring. Um, there was a lot of excitement there in 2004, 2004. And then the king said, enough, I've had enough petitions. He did allow municipal elections for half of the members on these municipal councils. That's about as, the only reform he carried out. But he just put an end to the whole thing. Uh, so I've seen him, this, these kinds of crackdowns before, it's cyclical. Um, now, abroad, if, well, I'm going to talk about Bahrain, and I'm not sure Bahrain is any more abroad for the, for, for the Saudis. I think they kind of think of it as part of the eastern province. Um, and they're not going to allow a, a majority Shia, Shiite uh, government to come to power no matter what. 
I think they will occupy the island before they allow that to happen. For them, it's a red line. I've never heard them talk about red lines, but Bahrain is a red line for them. They're not, they're, they're terrified that what happened in Iraq, from their point of view, the Americans went in there and ended up allowing a Shiite government to come to power that's pro-Iranian and change the balance of powers in the Gulf, and they're not going to allow the Iranians to get a foothold in Bahrain. Um, this is almost domestic politics rather than foreign policy. But, but what strikes me when I look at Saudi foreign policy be, beyond Bahrain is how, how complicated it is. Um, if you remember, the Saudis, together with the other Gulf Cooperation Council members, um, pushed the Arab League to declare a no-fly zone over Libya. I have never seen a group of Arab countries come out and arrange for the overthrow of another uh, leader publicly in order to promote some kind of more democratic system than Qaddafi had. Um, so that doesn't strike me as counter-revolutionary. Um, when you look at Yemen, he's trying to get rid of Ali Saleh. Um, they may be gambling that another military leader will end up taking his place, but on the other hand, Yemenis are really mobilized now. And it's going to be a different ball game for the Saudis, and that doesn't seem to bother them as much as Ali Saleh staying in power. Um, and the most interesting thing is their attitude towards uh, Syria and uh, Bashar, Assad. Initially they were supporting him, and then a few weeks back they pulled out their ambassador, and I'm told now that the propaganda coming out of the Saudi-controlled media has changed from not just being against Assad, or the Assad family, but being against and, and belittling uh, Alawite minority rule. In other words, they've, they're turning it into a sectarian struggle. Um, but in the process, indirectly, they're helping, you know, a more democratic system come in, come in, be established in um, in Syria. So they don't seem to be, you know, what their initial position was, by God, we're going to stick, stick with Assad no matter what because stability is more important than, than in these pro-democracy movements. Well, now they've changed their calculation. In Egypt, they provided, since the, since the uprising here, they've committed to four billion. Apparently, they've only actually uh, provided 500 million in cash. But I think they're going to provide $2 billion in, in financial support here. They've, the Qataris are doing the same thing. Um, so they don't seem to be, I don't see a campaign to stop the pro-democracy movement here. You know, they may, there may be Saudis supporting the Salafis because of ideological or uh, theological reasons. Um, but I don't see them, I don't see a, campaign by the Saudis to lead a counter-revolutionary movement across the Arab world. Um, what I do see is Saudi realpolitik at work, trying to figure out how to get on whose side as all these changes are taking place. Some people would call this realpolitik, as in their money. Um, the four billion they're giving here, but whether it's real or real uh, politic, um, um, I don't think it's really counter-revolutionary. It's just hard-nosed realism and trying to figure out how to get ahead of the curve, take advantage of the confusion, confusion, get the GCC countries to be, be playing a larger role in Arab politics now. Um, but it's not counter-revolutionary. So. To summarize my argument, arguments, um, I think the terms revolution and counter-revolution have served to 
confuse and obfuscate what's actually going on or not going on, both in Arab domestic and foreign policy. Um, and I think Egypt, Tunisia, and Libya are far from being real full-scale revolutions. Uh, Saudi Arabia has been extremely counter-revolutionary at home, if you will, and in Bahrain. Uh, but I don't see it leading a, a campaign across the Arab world to stop the pro-democracy movements in their tracks. With that, I will stop. Thank you, David. And could we get you to stay for a few sure, more sure, questions? Sure. Um, I actually would like to throw another uh, point into the mix. You work at the Wilson Center, which is a few blocks from the White House. What's really happening in the Obama administration with the Middle East right now? What, what's their take, really, and their policy on the Arab Spring? And in Egypt, there's been a long-standing relationship between the American uh, security and military establishment and the Egyptian military establishment. Yeah. Uh, how does the Obama administration view the Supreme Council in Egypt in this transition period? The pol Obama policy, as you all, I think we all agree, has been a mess, full of contradictions, not knowing how to, how to play Arab politics, when to change positions. Um, there's nothing to be proud of in the Obama policy towards either the Arab-Israeli issue or how they dealt with Mubarak here. Um, I think we have, sorry, we have a couple of examples of different attitudes, which, which shows the mixture of good and bad, or, or creative and non-creative. Um, we've left our ambassador in Damascus. He's gone out to meet the protesters. He's made the government furious by his, his activities there, but they haven't kicked him out. And the, the, Washington, who might have withdrawn its ambassador out of protest for what Assad is doing, is keeping him there. And he's speaking out. You know, would this had happened in Tahrir Square at the beginning? Um, so that's encouraging. Um, in Libya, we played a very crucial role in NATO's operations. It never could have happened without the United States, but they didn't take the front lead on this. Um, but if you think what's happening in Libya is going in the right direction, then the Americans, <clears throat> in this case, were on the right side. Now we're going into election season. And I don't see the Obama administration doing anything risky or um, creative, uh, particularly when two um, Democratic congressmen in seats in, in districts that are heavily Jewish have just lost their seats to Republicans. This is not something to make you feel bold about taking risks out in the Middle East and irritating Israel. Um, so I don't see anything happening uh, of substance in the Arab-Israeli negotiation process. And how does Washington see the, the military transition? Oh, the, the military. Um, you know, they say they spent a lot of effort getting American officers to call their, their counterparts in the uh, Egyptian military during those 18 days to individually encourage the military not to use violence or open fire. Um, that's what they say. Um, I think they now increasingly look upon the Egyptian military as, you know, the, the, the one institution with which they have very good contacts after all these years. And increasingly, the, the, the main hope for maintaining stability in this country during this transition process. Um, there has been a move in the Senate to suspend the $1.3 billion the Egyptian military gets every year uh, until we're sure that there are elections are held. 
but this is only in the Senate and it's only in a committee and the House isn't moving to pass this kind of legislation at all and nobody thinks they're going to. So I don't think it's going anywhere, but it's a sign of growing concern and interest in Congress about what's going on here. Could we have some questions from the audience, sir? Thank you. Ahmed Abu Shahidi is my name. Uh, I told you earlier that uh, I have read you often when I was in Washington. Uh, David, like you, I am a reporter. And one of the very first advices that was given to me as a young reporter was when I arrived into a city or a country or an event, I should write my impressions immediately, <laughs> lest they cool down and fade away. And it seems your impressions of what happened in Egypt and what's happening in the region has cooled down and faded away. You're giving us something that sounds like afterthoughts. And uh, let me tell you, 1952 was a coup d'etat. And it took the military officer that did that coup d'etat two years to name it a revolution. They called it move, they called it many things, yes. but it was a military coup d'etat like many that have taken place in the region. January 25th, in contrast, was a revolution, a full-fledged revolution carried out by the people of all classes, ages, sects, and religions. We were all there. Mona was there, I was there, Asim was there. I'm sure everyone in this room was there. Sure. The fact that things are not working out in the right direction does not mean that it is an uprising or some minor event. And finally, I'd like to, uh, to tell you that what is happening in the uh, Arab region, which is a huge region with a huge population that has been shortlisted often between Arabs. There is a great Arab revolution going on. The problem is people who normally give us the confidence of giving us big names like revolutions and so on are withholding it. They are undermining what is going on by calling it uprising or, you know, uh, unrest or whatever hmm. is taking place. Finally, I have a question for you. A lot is being said about what others are doing to undermine the uh, revolution in Egypt directly and indirectly, in particular Israel. Hmm. And the Israelis have come out in the open and they have said we have done so much in Egypt that Egypt would not be able to pull out of that dilemma we have put mm. them in. Could you comment on that aspect well, of our problem? You know, I don't know who the foreign hand is that the military is blaming for what happened Sunday. Um, they've arrested, what is it, 15 uh, provocateurs, thugs, whatever you want to call them. I presume they're interrogating them and see who they are and who paid them and why they were there and who gave them guns, etc. Um, is it the Israelis that did it? I have no idea. Um, uh, maybe we'll get a better idea when they finish these interrogations. And if indeed they will come out and tell, you, tell us all <coughs> really what happened. Uh, and I'm, I'm worried about the military. I don't like the way they're, the, 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 what's the trend. And um, I'm worried, I don't think you have hold of this revolution yet. And I'm worried about the Sudan model repeating itself here uh, through increased instability and the military feels it has to stay on. And then, uh, I, I'm not sure, I mean, a revolution is not created in a day. It's a process, and it has to change the structure. You, you at least have to have a change in the ruling elite. You know, and I look at your presidential candidates, they're all 70, 80 years old. <laughs> Where are the young people? No young people are running. Um, I look at your parties. Um, you know, it's hopefully you'll have new parties come up with younger leadership, but. Um, 
The process has just begun, and it could easily be reversed before it becomes a real revolution, even in the sense of a change of the ruling elite. But if the military ends up being the power or the power behind the throne, you don't even have a change in the ruling political elite. That's what I'm worried about. So um, you spoke about uh, your fear of the military taking oh. over uh, politically or continuing to dominate because it was already ruling the country in a sense. Anyway, Mubarak was from the military, so that's also something else. And you also spoke about the fact that you, you see Obama right now as being probably in a conservative mode, not interested in, in, in you know, upsetting the status quo and so forth. Now you mentioned the, the discussion in the Senate about suspending or forcing the military to implement democracy, but you said it's been fairly small and contained within the Senate. I would personally hypothesize that it's possible that at least within the upper echelons of the American government that perhaps there is a tendency to, behind the scenes, perhaps support the idea of a continuation of military dominance, that perhaps there is no real will within you know, the Obama administration to actually support true democracy in Egypt, but rather as some kind of a facade democracy, or even out, out, out and out military rule, so that uh, a populist government wouldn't come into mm. power and perhaps cause problems well, whether with Israel or with mm. American foreign policy in the region in general. I think you were sort of implying that. Well, I, you, I think you're right to be skeptical. Um, because um, one thing that, there are certain things that are really changing in, in, in the Arab world. Um, and other than the voice of the people coming into politics. And that is the legalization of Islamic parties in politics and coming to power and almost certainly in coalitions, but nonetheless, they're going to be in power. This is a major change. I, I don't know if it's a revolution or not. Is, is the AKP coming to power a revolution? Nobody in Turkey talks about the Turkish revolution. <coughs> the Turkish revolution. Um, but I think the prospect of Islamic parties here playing an important and maybe dominant role in, the, in a future government <clears throat> after the elections um, causes problems in, for a lot of people in Congress and also in the administration about um, what hath democracy brought. <laughs> and um, makes them more willing to um, count on the military to maintain stability and to keep Egypt um, uh, a, 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 a country that hopefully will look more like Turkey, where you, even if you have uh, Islamists in power, there's a separation of mosque and state. Um, I, I think that's what they're hoping that you could have, with the military here playing some kind of role in the background to maintain stability. Uh, I'm so sorry, but I uh, feel that for a second time in one year, Americans really don't understand what's happening here. You don't really read it. I think that's why in the 25th of January, it was a big surprise for many, what happened here in Egypt. Uh, first, the term revolution doesn't mean a change in just economic, social, uh, because if it's done like 52 by a military coup and the people are dominated this is not a revolution so using the term change like el bas in iraq where saddam really massacred people and say this was a revolution i think the term is used incorrectly uh, what's happening here really is the people taking after 60 years of military rule the power in their hands, and they want to change. Who's stopping this is the old regime with all its factions, you know, businessmen and Saudi Arabia, United States, Israel, all Gulf areas, uh, governments are really working hard. And the <clears throat> financing 
the Salafists here and giving them power. Even the military is giving them power mm -hmm. in TV and media. So that's what is the counter-revolution mm -hmm. they are preparing to stop, but they will not succeed because what's happening here is so deep. It's not just here. It's spreading, but it's so deep until all the workers are striking for the first time in mm -hmm. It's a real, real change, yeah. but they are trying to stop this, but they will not succeed. Thank you. Well, I hope you're, I hope you're right that it is that the people do prevail. I'm just saying it hasn't happened yet. As we're running out of time, could I just ask to leave it to a question, ma'am? Just leave it to a question rather than a response to what David has already said. Please. I'm under the impression that America feels that the army is secular. I don't think the army is secular. What do you think? I mean, the army has been infiltrated by Islamists and the foreign hand. Why Israel? Why not Saudi Arabia? Um, you know, I don't know enough about the army. I did live through the, the assassination of, of Sadat when you know, um, militant groups managed to infiltrate the army quite successfully, and the, the higher ups in the military didn't know it. Um, whether similar movement or process is taking place now, I don't know, but the scoff statement seemed to be in favor of a was it called civil government, separation of mosque and state. So at least in their pronouncements. And uh, they seem to be um, uh, the Islamists are not in control of the scoff, at this, uh, as far as I can see. Could, could the events of, since January 25th uh, be regarded as a clash between generations? Uh, be regarded as what? As a clash between generations. A what? Clash between generations. Was generation oh, yeah, definitely. Clash between uh, uh, generations. I, you know, I don't know because, you know, I, there were a lot of families out there. Parents, grandparents, kids, you know, three generations. Um, you know, whether this is going to stay that way or the older folks are going to say, we don't like all this instability, and we're going, they're going to end up supporting the NDP, you know, rebir reborn in, a, in, a, in new parties, et cetera. I don't know. Um, but I did, it seemed to me it was quite, you know, intergenerational, this um, Tahrir Square uprising. Sir? Um, David, uh, where do you see Egypt heading, uh, say, in a year from now? And uh, what is the best case scenario and worst case scenario? Uh, the best case is you have good elections. Whatever percent, you know, the Islamist parties get, they're still going to have to have a coalition. They work out a common platform. Um, things calm down. The military retreats um, from an active involvement. The, the, the kind of involvement we're seeing now, um, and you have a real evolution towards uh, a, a democratic system, not dominated by the military, but actually led by civilians. The worst scenario is that you have more of these incidents keep taking place. You know, I, I don't know what's going on, but it, I watched Tahrir Square, and I was thoroughly unimpressed by the military's inability to control a very small number of people. And we watched till after midnight. And it wasn't until midnight that they finally got enough, I don't know whether they were troops or central security police or who, who were there because it's, it was too far away and it was dark. But they finally got enough bodies there to try and contain people trying to get out of Talat Harb Street and into the circle, but uh, into the Midan. But, you know, if you keep having these incidents, then the, the pull, for, the demand for the military to stay in politics, and there was just some poll I was reading, the 90% of Egyptians still trust the scoff more than any other institution in this country. 
they seem to have a lot of popularity here, you know, outside of Midan Tahir. Um, so, so they have, you have continued troubles. You do get a government, but it's fractious, fragmented, and unable to come up with economic programs to deal with the problems. The Sudan model, the economic problems overwhelm the government, and the military has to come back in to try and run the country. That's the worst scenario. We're over time, but let's go for three more questions. Back against the wall. Hi, David. How are you? Um, on the Sudan model, I think that it's a bit, it's really different from here in that the military in 64 and also after when Numeri was ousted did completely withdraw and then the politicians messed it up. I think yeah. here or in the Turkish case, one will have the military, fortunately or unfortunately, still more involved. And uh, in, in 69, it was a completely different set of military officers who took over from the ones that had been overthrown in 64. Mm -hmm. um, also, the one positive side of the model is that in 85, they had a transitional military council. It stayed in for exactly one year, mm -hmm. and it did turn over to an elected government at that time, so mm -hmm. they did withdraw at that time. Uh, and again, in yeah. 89, it was a completely different set of officers who took over, so there wasn't continuity on the military side in terms of the coups. Just quickly on Saudi, I'm not sure they're so benign. I mean, even look at the Yemeni case. They could have kept Salah in his hospital in Riyadh, and they sent him back to Sana'a. Yeah. So I won't go any further, but that <laughs> strikes me that they're playing an interesting game. You have a question? that they're very concerned that who is going to protect their assets or who can they trust not to take their assets, let me put it that way, and that they don't trust the liberals and it's no. kind of a question as to whether they think the Islamists, they can kind of deal with them, no. they're negotiating with them on that, or, or you know, the thugs or the, yeah. you know, so forth. So th those, those, the, the security yeah. forces, the NDP, um, no. and the role that, that they're well, playing. That's one more reason I'm concerned about whether the military is going to leave politics because they haven't been able to preserve their position. And if you have all these civilians being thrown in jail because of corruption and economic corruption, um, there have got to be some people in the military wondering what's going to happen if the civilians are ruling and what's going to happen to them. And also, it doesn't seem to me there's been any agreement on what role the military should continue to play here, which has got to make them nervous. Um, I mean, you know, it's kind of appalling that Parliament here never even could look at their budget. <laughs> I mean, the military has really been a separated operation here with no control by civilians. So to go from no control to total control without any conflict or pushback from the military, I'd really be surprised. I would expect trouble. And which is another reason that makes me think um, that the military may have various reasons for wanting to continue to play a role here. Unless they're able to work out some agreement with the new political parties, protecting them from, from some of these various questions you're, you're, you know, you're, you're raising. Um, so, yes, I agree with you. <laughs> اه معي السؤال اساله باللغه العربيه في الفتره الاخيره حضرتك قلت كان في تحالفات بين الاخوان او التيارات الاسلاميه مع بعض التحالفات من الاحزاب هل في من وجهه نظرك هذه التحالفات هل هي حقيقيه او جاده سوري طب بالنسبه حضرتك قلت في Uh, uh, okay. Go ahead. Uh, 
عبد الفتاح حامد مع رئيس منظمة الشرق الأوسط للسلام وحول الإنسان سؤالي عن بالنسبة لحضرتك قلت إن في تحالفات بين التيار الإسلامي أو الإخوان المسلمين وبعض الأحزاب السياسية الموجودة أو التكتلات بنلاحظ إن هل هذه من وجهة نظرك التحالفات هل هي حقيقية أو جدة للإخوان في التغيير يعني إحنا شفنا كان في بعض الأحيان دعوات من بعض التيارات الإسلامية عدم نزول التحرير في بعض أيام الجمعة لكنهم كانوا بينزلوا كان في البعض بعض القيادات كانت بتنزل سؤالي هل هذه التحولات اللي هي الدعاية لها فترة الانتخابات لكسب مقاعد أكثر أو لكسب أصوات وبعد ذلك بعد الانتخابات يرجعوا إلى ظهور بشكل منفرد وإظهار الشعارات الإسلامية مرة أخرى؟ um. I look at it as the, the, the Muslim Brotherhood and it's the Freedom and Justice Party and <clears throat> realizes um, and is willing to deal with um, non-Islamic parties, that it is not going to get 65% of the vote, that it's going to get 35 or you know, maybe 40 or 25, you know, somewhere in that range. And they're going to have to have a coalition after elections, and that they're already starting to figure out who, who, who might be their coalition partners. Um, you know, I've, in Tunisia, in Nahda tried to form um, alliances with um, non-religious parties. And they finally all agreed, we're all going to run on our own, and we want to see what our independent strength is. And then, after elections, we will form coalitions. Because Ennahda is ready to form a coalition. They don't want to rule alone either. I haven't, either here in Tunisia or here, I don't think the, the Muslim Brotherhood parties want to be in charge alone. So to me, what's going on, like the Waft is now split off. Um, because the Waft wanted to run uh, people in all constituencies. They want to find out what their real strength is. And uh, so I get this feeling that you, you get these serious coalitions after the elections <clears throat> more than right now, although the Freedom and Justice Party has started looking to see who might, they might be able to cooperate with after the elections. So it's a kind of a process that started and will become much more serious after the elections. Thank you very much for your presentation, answering those questions. My great, pleasure. Great pleasure to have you back in Cairo. Thank you very much. And I, 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 let me just check. I think we have some refreshments after this uh, conference, so please join us outside for some refreshments. Thank you.